Thank you very much, Mr. Srikant Shastri. Um, and he's given a very long introduction to me. <laughs> but, uh, well, my interests have changed slowly over the years. And I like to start with something which is new, but uh, seems very exciting. Um, <clears throat> of course, the subject I'm talking about is not new in that sense. I've been working on it for more than 20 years. Well, and thank you very much, um, um, yeah, <laughs> and inviting me uh, to this place to give this lecture here at um, Indira Nagar. Um, well, clouds, you know, clouds are something which everybody is aware of. And I remember that when I was a young boy in South Bangalore, at the edges of South Bangalore, and that was in the 1940s. I mean, although the war was raging <laughs> in Europe and later on in Asia as well, uh, I still remember how fascinated I was with the clouds. Bangalore in the 1940s and before was not like Bangalore now. In Bangalore now, I, I'm actually, it's very rare that you can see the horizon and wonder as the sun is setting. Because where you live, you're covered by other houses, uh, <laughs> high rise, or at least multiple floors, pollution, all kinds of things. So the way that Bangalore used to be, it's called the garden city at that time, very proudly by its citizens. It was a very quiet city. It was a beautiful city. And it was beautiful not only because uh, the city itself was so quiet and so on, but also because you didn't have to go very far to come in touch with nature and see wonderful sunsets wonderful sunrises and so on. I find that I can't do that anymore. But anyway, my interest in uh, clouds remained. And um, it was about uh, 20, 25 years ago that I began to wonder why, although the cumulus cloud, well, I'll, I'll come to that in a moment, the cumulus cloud um, is something which is very familiar to all of you. As you see the pictures, you will recognize them easily. A cumulus is something which is a heap, which, um, as you as you see, will be seen there. Actually, it is there in the background. There are three clouds, faint clouds in the background. And as the title says, the one at the left is in the sky, the one in the middle is in the lab, and the one at the right extreme is on the computer. So over the years, uh, I and my students and postdocs and so on have uh, covered this, this width, uh, in each case understanding a little bit more than we had done before. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> as far as India is concerned, um, the clouds have always meant something to us. Uh, Indian literature, for example, in Sanskrit and in other languages too, uh, talks about clouds with uh, with love and with, uh, <laughs> and with uh, very beautiful descriptions. And so it is in fact, therefore, uh, something which is not only just science, but uh, art and literature as well. I think it's uh, correct to say that clouds became science uh, at two times, you can say. Uh, the first time was when 200 years ago, they started began names to these clouds, Latin words. Cumulus is a Latin word uh, in Europe, so that it was the same across different languages. <clears throat> but really, it started seriously only around the 1950s. I have a very well-known book by David Brunt. On the, it's called Dynamical Meteorology, written around that time. If you look at the index, you won't get the word cloud. In other words, surprising as it may seem, his role in meteorology was at that time somehow not the kind of meteorology that people were studying. But since then, of course, the effort on clouds has been enormous. Now, I want to start with two videos. And one is uh, a video of monsoon clouds over India and East Asia. Um, yeah. 
man. Well, that is, of course, a um, very quick thing of uh, clouds, uh, monsoon clouds, and you can see that sometimes they cover the whole country, and sometimes the whole country has no clouds. Even during, uh, even during the monsoons, this, uh, this, even during the monsoon season, which will be roughly from the end of May to about uh, the middle or so of September, uh, things vary a great deal. So that's the kind of thing that you see. Most of them are cumulus clouds, and uh, you can see that uh, these are coming from the northeast largely, so it's probably taken during the northeast uh, monsoons. Now let me go to the other one. Um, let's see. Here. Uh, the, here, but this is the tropics, and uh, of course rainfall is uh, uh, you know, the life of uh, India. Um, if rainfall was bad, but we had a particularly peculiar monsoon season this year, and so everybody is now beginning to say that was climate change. But if I look at this now, these are clouds in Arizona, where well, very dry part of the United States. But still, you get clouds there, now and then. And you can see the clouds rising. And it's interesting to see. They're all cumulus types. And uh, you can see the different shapes. But almost all of them, and there's such heat on the, on the land surface and such high temperatures that uh, clouds keep rising. But the interesting thing is what happens. Look at that cloud. Look at, look at how, how rapidly. Ah, and it got totally isolated. And it's gone very fast. It rose too high, gone very fast. Of course, this is the fast movie from one point of view. And you can see. Well, it's, it's very interesting that in the desert state of Arizona, you get these extraordinary results. And then they will, of course, um, disappear too. Well, let me stop there. And um, as I start with clouds in uh, poetry and art. There are only three slides, but I thought we must do that. And in India, as uh, all of you here will know, these, uh, these clouds have been sung about a great deal in many languages. I just want to pick one, one uh, illustration, one verse from uh, Kalidasa's Meghaduta. Meghaduta stands for the cloud messenger. And many of you, you will have known that story. And the cloud messenger was a messenger which uh, a civil servant, I would say, in today's language, who had done something which he should not have done in the capital of that northern kingdom where uh, he was working for the king. So for his crime, he was banished and sent to the south. But his wife still remained there near the Himalayas. And so after a while, he begins to miss her very much and catches, catches hold of a cloud and sent a message through that cloud to his wife and the Himalayas. And these are his instructions to the cloud. This is just an example of what it is. So, well, Vakraf Pantha, Yadipi Bhavata, and so on in Sanskrit. But if you translate it to English, even as you wish to journey northwards, do zigzag along your path. And to linger at Ujjain. Ujjain was a famous city, considered very beautiful and uh, very important. And uh, his cloud takes about 30 days, about a month, to get there from um, the southern town where he was to Himalayas. Surprisingly, he was very close to what happens. In, um, in the 1970s, yeah, and let's see. Um, maybe I'll first show you that. In the 1980s, this one, at the end of the 70s, Sikha and Gadgil, Gadgil, Surachana Gadgil, was working at the Institute of Science. Sikha was at Pune. Um, the first satellite pictures began to appear. This one was from NOAA. And they found this whole row of clouds across India. And what is more, they actually uh, found out how it actually moves. And they found that there was a kind of a 30-day period. Now let me go back to the other one which is about the time that the cloud actually took to go from the south to the north. Um, so you see, already at that time, 
they had a rough idea that these clouds move from the south to the north, and, uh, and in fact, they do affect the weather. It uh, came to be known as uh, <coughs> the intertropical convergence zone, or just the tropical convergence zone, and is, uh, one of the major features of uh, <coughs> monsoons. Well, that's there, and here is a piece of art, and you can see clouds at the back, and here are these people dancing and singing. Um, and that's an art piece in uh, the 18th century. Here is an English, um, was very famous when I was in school. At that time, we studied a lot of school, a lot, a lot at school in English. Shelley's on the cloud. I won't, I won't really read through all of it, but I just want you to look at what uh, his way of looking at it is. This is a cloud speaking. I silently laugh at my own cenotaph. You see, it's a finite life. And out of the caverns of rain, like a child from the womb and a, like a ghost from the tomb, I arise and unbuild it again. That's to say, it comes back once again to the sky. Well, OK, clouds in nature. Let me give you a quick picture of them. Those are cumulus clouds. You can see how they rise. They're uh, fractal edges, so to speak, and the heaps that they are. This is one affected by the hills behind. It's a, an orographic cloud. Um, this is also something like that, uh, fairly high in altitude. Here is one which uh, Bangaloreans will uh, identify, I think. That uh, little tower is the one in Lalbagh. It's a Kempegowda tower. Kempegowda set up four towers uh, around what he would be, the future of Bangalore. And there are clouds in the background, and the Kempegowda tower is in front, and then um, here is a tower cloud, warm land cumulus clouds, lots of them, a very fluffy cloud on one side, and on the other side it's a shooting plume, both are cumulus clouds. And um, well, the title is not there, this is also cumulus clouds there. This is one thing which was taken from uh, NASA, Japan, satellite with a Japanese radar in 1946. So, uh, sorry, sorry, 19, um, 2005, sorry, it's 2005. And these clouds actually rose as much as 16 kilometers, generally, but even up to 21 kilometers. There are the images from a radar, which uh, was made actually by the Japanese and mounted on that NASA satellite. So you can, you can see how far they can rise, these clouds. It can be huge. Well, evening clouds. Little balls here. Now that's uh, Tejas on the clouds. Tejas is the uh, light combat aircraft, uh, which was uh, built in India and is actually flying now. So now, there are many types of cloud. And um, the World Meteorological Organization defines a cloud as a visible aggregate of minute particles of water or ice of both in the free air. And it was named about 200 years ago, many of these, more than 200 years ago. And uh, there are all those names. And in particular, the most interesting things are the cumulus, which is really um, largely what I'm going to talk about here. And the stratus, that is sheets. Cumulus is a heap. Stratus is a sheet. And then uh, cirrus. Number three there, which is actually a filament, a filament kind of cloud. And um, we will very largely uh, look at the cumulus clouds. Now, the most important thing, now I'm beginning to talk as a fluid dynamics man, most, the most important thing in these clouds is that they are generally turbulent flows. Okay. Um, well, I know many experts here, so I don't have to explain to them what a turbulent flow is, but for those who might not have come across these words, fluid flows uh, can be very broadly divided into three types. Uh, there are, first of all, laminar flows, smooth. Uh, they don't need a statistical description. And um, you can quite often see that you pour honey out, it's always a low Reynolds number phenomenon. Reynolds number is a non-dimensional parameter, which I'll talk about a little later on. 
Then you can also have turbulent flows, which are irregular and chaotic, and demand a statistical description. And in between, as it goes from laminar to turbulent, is a transitional range. Laminar flows are generally amenable to theory, experiment, and computation. But turbulent flows remain to this day, to this day, not really understood. It may surprise most people, but in fact, although the basic laws governing fluid flow are known, are supposed to be known, including the turbulent state, we've uh, not been able during the last two centuries to solve the problem. This doesn't mean that we can't do anything about it, but the problem still remains unsolved. Now, this is just to illustrate transition. Simple thing, a cigarette uh, a plume coming from the cigarette. You can see that the lower half is lamina, obviously, you know, no disorder. And it's very sudden transition to turbulent flow in this case, because these flows are unstable. And you can see that out there is turbulent flow. And we are looking at the turbulent side of what happens in a cloud. Now, I just want to say briefly that uh, the problem with turbulence is really quite serious. And, um, you know, equations governing the mean turbulent flow characteristics, such as the mean velocity of this chaotic flow, or the mean, root mean square velocity, um, velocity uh, in the fluctuating turbulence, any equation which you write down for them is not closed. That's to say it has more unknowns than uh, the number of equations you have. And therefore, engineers have, of course, to get a lot of data. And uh, they've made equations carrying these uh, quantities, the mean square uh, root, the energy, the momentum, and so on, the mean quantities. And where it's unclosed, they made some approximations. And those equations are called Reynolds equations. And by and large, manage many of the relatively simple turbulent flows. But uh, if, those, uh, if the turbulent flow is doing something strange, these equations are still not enough. Uh, there are a large number of turbulence models, and they involve assumptions that are really not generally justified. Now, the mathematical theory has been unable to handle either the Navier Stokes equations, which are the full equations for the fluid flow, or the Reynolds equations, which, as I said, is a, a kind of an average thing. We are unable to handle either one of them in a very general way. And um, for example, uh, if you take the pressure loss in a water pipe, when the flow is turbulent, it cannot be predicted by theory even today. Okay, this, this may come as a surprise to most people. In fact, <laughs> when I first made this statement, I remember many years ago, um, the pressman called me up and said, is this true? I said, look, I'm not saying that it is not known, but it's known only because we've made measurements and we've fitted formulas to them and made some kind of uh, theory, but it can't be traced back to the equations, which is the true. If you were to be able to do it, it is a price of $1 million waiting for you from a rich American. It's not been, it's not been given yet. And great scientists have always said, Feynman said, turbulence is the last unsolved problem of classical physics. And astrophysicists who tell you what happened at uh, the Big Bang and so on. However, as soon as convection starts, they do the same thing as what the engineers do. And von Neumann uh, made this other comment. The impact of an adequate theory of turbulence on certain very important parts. Now, you must remember that von Neumann was a mathematician, physicist mathematician. He says that an adequate theory of turbulence uh, may have a, the impact of such a theory on certain very important parts may be even greater on pure mathematics than on fluid mechanics. I mean, if you solve the problem, you've actually done a big, made a big contribution to pure mathematics as well. But at but bottom, the problem of turbulence is a mathematical problem and has divided, decided, divided, sorry, defied solution to this day. Well, some years ago, five years ago, nature had this thing. And so this is now, as of 2015, it's saying, physicists, your planet needs you. <laughs> and, and you really must do and help 
you know, to solve, to see how to can solve the problem of uh, physics. Well, so in the first place, clouds are very complex flows. There are multiple places. Uh, they can be water vapor, they can be liquid water, they can be ice, they can be all kinds of other particles. Uh, there's microphysics, thermodynamics, radiation, and so on. And you just say, I'm going to do all of them. You find that the, that the problem seems absolutely formidable. Um, one of the things that are, one of the parameters that uh, has uh, attracted a great attention and is a very important one is what is called entrainment. How fluid outside the cloud gets into the fluid? How can it get into the fluid? How much of it gets in? How much of it gets out? Because that determines what happens in the cloud later on. Well, there have been theories about it. One uh, popular one, going back to the 1950s, 40s, and 50s, is that the cloud is a plume. You can see it at the bottom here. Um, let's see. Where did I leave? Yeah. You can see it at the bottom here. Um, the plume grows linearly with height. And um, you have a center line velocity here, you see. And these outside velocities, VE. And the proposal at that time was that uh, that velocity and training velocity is proportional to UC, so the ratio is a certain constant. And um, that was about as far as it went. But in actual fact, you know, suppose you take a real view of uh, the flow. This is actually um, um, what you may call an exact solution. It's a computational solution, however. An exact solution or a computational solution of the full equations, the name of Stokes equations, for a jet, steady state jet. And you can see what the jet looks like. You can see that it's edge here. It's actually a fractal. Its dimension can be calculated. And you see all these green and yellow things, blobs here. That is vorticity. I come to what vorticity is, where a vortex, all of you know a vortex. It's something which is going around. And um, this is a totally chaotic vorticity field here. And the edge of that vorticity field is the edge of the jet. But the air outside, or the fluid outside, is not coming in straight lines. You see how it's going in here. They're all collecting to go in here, or here, or here. You know. There are inrush events, so to speak. And similarly, there may be outrush uh, things too. So the way that um, this happens is actually very important. And that also we must understand. And we've, in fact, done some work on the jets which is uh, just about, um, it's available. So cumulus clouds can be shallow, deep, fluffy, smooth, boiling or fading, uh, loners, crowded, chaotic, ordered, you know, there are all kinds of uh, flow fluids. Now I first want to talk about some experiments we made. And this is a picture which came from those experiments. Um, you have cloud fluid dynamics. Actually, I'll come back to this. I think it may be better, but I should uh, give you the background to this. So when I started thinking about clouds, I said, why can't we make experiments on cloud flows? Can we make experiments on cloud flows in the lab? Well, I tried it with steam and uh, other substances, and it was not it was a nuisance. Then it occurred to me, maybe we should try it in water, because perhaps the most important thing there is the heat release which takes place when uh, moist air rises from the ground, warm moist air rises from the ground, but as it reaches the level at which the water vapor will condense, that's when you will begin to see it as a cloud. And that latent heat, well, I said, maybe the latent heat is playing a big part with it. And let's see if we can actually make an experiment where we can put enough heat into the liquid or into a fluid to see whether you can make it behave like a cloud. And you can see that it actually contains a real cloud. Real cloud 
You know, you have to do all of this, microphysics and thermodynamics, radiation, and so on. But, and phase transitions here. But uh, what we studied at first was just this. Uh, we are not now there in this, within this green rectangle, but this is this green rectangle that we did. Then namely, you put heat and look at what happens to the fluid. Well, so I, when I said I, will, we will, <laughs> I would like to study clouds this way, the people from whom I was asking money uh, didn't believe that that could be done. And so they sent somebody, a well-known scientist, to come to my lab and find out whether, um, whether there was any sense to what we were saying. Well, uh, after a lot of discussion, he went back, convinced that, uh, first of all, we had the instrumentation for doing much of this. And secondly, also, that maybe there is an idea worth trying. Anyway, we got a grant from there, and we started making these experiments. But before I go to the experiments themselves, it's good to see how jets and plumes spread. Now, this depends on a quantity called the Reynolds number. The Reynolds number tells you how important or how unimportant the viscosity of the fluid is in a flow. If the Reynolds number is uh, very large, viscosity is not very important. If the Reynolds number is small, viscosity is actually important. Now, I have two flows here. In fact, in both cases, it would seem that Reynolds number is large, but in one case, very large. Uh, on this side, you have 10 to the 4, which is actually not a very large Reynolds number, but uh, quite, quite large for the lab. And this one is a rocket, rocket, rocket plume, and being tested there. That's a Reynolds number of 10 to the 8, okay. 100 million. This is 10,000. But you see, the angle at which they're spreading is really not very different. Here we know exactly what the flow is, everywhere, inside and outside. Here we don't know what's happening on the outside. So I began to think that the Reynolds number is not the problem. Um, so we should be able to do it in the lab. The major thing, uh, in terms of the effect on the flow, is the heat release. It's, it's, it's a hypothesis. And therefore, you make a non-dimensional number on the amount of heat released to this flow which you have. And uh, that is that parameter there, where beta is the thermal coat of expansion, g is the acceleration due to gravity, rho is density, cp is um, um, the specific heat, j is the off-source heating that will come down below, b and u are the length and velocity scales at the width and velocity scales. So that's a non-dimensional group. The most important things here are, of course, the, these are properties of the fluid and numbers which are known. But this is the, this is the key, the total heat put in by u cube b. Now, fortunately, some people have made uh, some measurements in the atmosphere about how much heat you put, uh, heat is had to, put into the, to be put into the cloud. And uh, they gave a number. And I sort of said, OK, if I'm doing it in a water tank about that size, about one meter broad, one meter deep, and maybe one and a half meters tall, well, how much heat should I put into that water in order to reproduce the condition that the cloud experiences? It turns out to be actually very realistic. Um, in fact, if you put in about one kilowatt into the water, uh, right way, the right way, you're actually producing the same fluid dynamical condition as in the cloud. And that was uh, very good news. So this is the way that it works, actually. Uh, you can see the plume on the ground. This is, this is a kind of a model for the cloud. There's a hot patch on the ground, let's say. This is a highly idealized cloud, cumulus cloud. And that produces a plume here. And then, at the condensation level, you have uh, the water vapor condensing, so heat is released here. And then after that, that's a cumulus cloud. Uh, cumulus clouds have flat bottoms. And in fact, one way you can recognize them is the flat, you know, that that's where the water is condensing. So that seemed like a good thing to do. 
and uh, we actually found a way of putting this heat into the cloud flow and uh, actually produce some clouds. And so now, this is one case. Actually, uh, this is among the first experiments we made. Um, on the right-hand side is the flows we made of that, uh, of that um, plume. Um, well, this one growing slowly, one's the shorter one and the longer one. And it's almost exactly like the real clouds, which I took from an album of uh, clouds. You can see that, in fact, these plumes in the lab are behaving, at least in the shape and uh, the way that they develop, almost exactly like the real clouds. So I thought, okay, there is a, there is a lot in it there to do, and perhaps we should go ahead and spend much more time on it. And these are fake clouds. Those are real clouds. Well, OK. So you know, we first made a simple apparatus, but this is the apparatus we have now. I won't, I won't uh, go into it in detail, uh, except to tell you that it's all done in a water tank, which uh, that's the tank. It's about one meter broad and about one and a half meter high. And the fluid there is water, but water which has been very carefully processed. Um, we first of all want the heat to go only to the cloud fluid. And therefore, we mix some acid with the water and we pump that acid out through from below to above. So here is where the water is and we put in some acid into that water um, well, uh, sorry, that comes from here. Uh, and that goes through this place and comes out. Whereas this water here is uh, deionized, so it's non conducting. Now, here is the heat injection zone. And you put in heat here by applying a voltage across the electrodes which stand across the plume. So you can put in the, from this Univac, for example, Bariac. Sorry, very not doing that. Uh, you can put in uh, heat uh, either there to make an upper level stratification, but also here to make a hot fluid rise. And this this makes that hot fluid in the plume, and then this puts in the heat, which is the analog of uh, the condensation, the heat release of the condensation of uh, water vapor. And here are various other instruments required to actually make measurements. And this is the way that we first made the experiment. It's a jet going up like this. Steady jet. We started the steady jet. And uh, that's the width. And this is the preheating zone. This is the heat injection zone and the post-heating zone. So we put somewhere between a few hundred watts to about a kilowatt here and uh, look at how much the flow changes, if it changes at all. So I've given the numbers here. And to get the same value of G in a water tank, in clouds, as in clouds, we need to release a heat of about one kilowatt. So it's actually simple to do, relatively simple to do. And uh, this idea is the basis for the design of the offsource heating mechanism. Um, So dynamical similarity, this cloud flow in the water tank is dynamically similar to the flow in the sky. Surprising as it may seem, uh, in fact, that we are doing in the water. But of course, there is one important limitation in what we are doing. You don't have stratified flow outside. And um, we don't um, also have, um, you know, all these particles, we don't have raindrops, um, <coughs> particles, ices, and so on, none of them are there. This is just a highly idealized cloud flow. And uh, we can get the right, roughly the right kind of heat release numbers. So you can see there, actually, um, okay. they're actually in about the same range. And so we can see that uh, there must be some 
similarity. Well, anyway, we now started comparing it with real clouds. Well, you saw it already in the background in my first slide. This is a real cloud at the left, a laboratory cloud, this one, this apparatus, the heat injection zone is here. These are electrodes, and you supply a voltage here, and that's what makes the flow here. Not very different from this. And this is actually a computer solution. Well, not quite as close as this is, but still you can see that it has a dome-like shape at the top. Now, it depends on how you add the water, I'm sorry, how you add the heat, what its history is, and how it varies with time. Those are uh, important variables. And we actually, after some work, we found out how to get that sort of thing right. This is a cumulus congestus cloud. Now, I, I consider that this is uh, remarkably similar but in fact, it depends on how you add the heat. And here is the power you put in, as you can see. Uh, the power is on or off here. And then you see how much power is put in here. And um, the total history is here. And that history leads to this kind of uh, congestus cloud. Well, congestus, congestus is a Latin word. It's, uh, it's related to the word congestion, which you always use for our traffic here in Bangalore, which is the world's worst. That's what the newspapers say yesterday or today. But uh, we look for other things too. That history may be different or that uh, place may be different. And um, if you see that blue line below, uh, it tells you when this flow occurred. So in this case, it's 100. 10 or 20 seconds after you started. Uh, on the left is the real cloud, and on the right is uh, the lab cloud. Another one here, also cumulus congestus, different one. This is a mediocris. Once again, although it's Latin, it is like the word mediocre. Uh, so it's, it's not a strong cloud. It's, uh, it is actually a weak one and the amount of heat that's put in uh, is actually small, as you can see. It's only a few hundred uh, watts, and only for a short time. And then it's, it's like those Arizona clouds that you saw. You can do that. This is another cumulus mediocris. The cumulus fractals, it's as if things have been torn apart at the edge. I don't know how many of you have seen what happens to clouds during a total solar eclipse. Uh, it's actually very interesting to watch the clouds, apart from the other things that happen in a solar eclipse. And um, uh, I and my group went ahead and made some measurements during one of these solar eclipses. And um, what happens really is that those clouds, uh, as, the, as the shadow, as the moon's shadow goes across the sun, um, and gets it gets getting darker, and therefore the kind of amount of fluid rising from the ground as the plume goes down because the ground gets cooler. And eventually, as you get close to total eclipse, totality in the eclipse, uh, the clouds disappear. Small clouds all disappear, especially if this happens not during the monsoons, but during, well, let's say, February, for example, which is when these experiments were made. Um, and then, as the, as the eclipse is over, uh, these clouds form once again. But while there were fluffy clouds in the beginning, they're more like this kind of fractus clouds after the eclipse. They've been torn apart. And therefore, although they reassemble, their shape has changed. And here is the cumulus fractus, another one. Here is the history of those clouds. And um, how clouds may break away. You see, after the third thing there, the cloud may be able to break away. It has to do with the way that you add heat here. And it's that heating profile, sorry, this uh, heat distribution number here, is this kind of profile that makes it possible for this uh, to occur. 
man. So what are the important parameters? I think the most important parameter is actually the second entry, heating profile history. You use different profiles, and there's a history. That is what really determines the kind of profile that you get. And uh, lower and upper stratification. The flow history to some extent, but that's in this case not a very important variable. And basically how much momentum you have and how much buoyancy flux you have and different combinations. You see a wide variety of cumulus shapes, types, and flows. What about the entrainment? Here is an entrainment coefficient defined there at the bottom. It is the amount of mass coming into the cloud divided by uh, the velocity in the flue and its uh, diameter. So it's not dimensional, as you can easily verify. And um, after we had made these experiments in 2011, and uh, other people followed, some right here in India, and some also uh, from the United States. Agarwal and Prasad, although they're both Indians, they made these experiments after Prasad made a visit to my lab. And you can see that um, the general features are similar, but uh, they don't, of course, agree uh, in exact location. It always it remains a little constant after you've added the heat. And then the entrainment coefficient goes up, that's to say there's more entrainment, and then it drops down. It is below normal, and eventually it may even be zero. So it looks as if this thing, by and large, behaves very much like a cloud. Now, suppose you take a cross section. This is once again done in the lab. We make a plume, and uh, we put uh, heat into that plume, showing these methods. The ordinary plume is this kind of cloud on the left. Okay, that's also turbulent, as you can see. But uh, there are all those uh, densities. There's a dye in there, a dye density. It's sort of, of course, chaotic, turbulent, but it's roughly distributed over the thing reasonably well. But you look at what it is in the cloud-like form here, where you can see immediately that the structure of this is very different from the structure of this. There is, in fact, you know, almost a plug of flow here, you know, without uh, these other, this other fluid, the outside fluid being in there. It's a core. It's a core which is really basically uh, just the dye which you're putting. And outside, the flow is turbulent, but of a character very different from this really. Now, why has that happened? Well, we did a wavelet analysis on it. I won't go into what wavelet analysis is. It enables you to select a certain range of uh, frequencies in uh, 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 images like this. So you start with that image, and it's a, it's a bit like a Fourier transform, or a Fourier series. And you find that at a certain scale, in this turbulent flow, this kind of order emerges. And after you make a few more experiments and measurements, you realize that that y-axis is actually a vortex ring. It's a vortex ring at the bottom, at the bottom of what is called a coherent structure. And I'll show you that uh, in a short while. You don't see that coherent vortex in the, in the left-hand side because that, is, uh, that contains all kinds of frequencies and wavelengths. Um, but that other image, which is only a core, heated, heated plume, cloud plume, you can see what the thing shows there. Here, the density variation is not high, but uh, it's, it's one blob here, and the others are, of course, distributed. And uh, measurements in the atmosphere show that this is, in fact, true. And you can find here that there's an interval, for example, out there. When the droplet concentration of the volume, these are measurements made in the atmosphere. Uh, the droplet, uh, they, they fluctuate around here. This is turbulent flow, but this is the core. In the core, they're very nearly constant. And then again, turbulent flow. So well, in fact, even those uh, protected cores in the cloud, as they're called, 
in the metrology, they're there in this very simple thing. You can just see how many of these effects are just from the heating. And the cloud plume, as you can see here, the ordinary plume is on the left, the cloud plume is on the right. And uh, you can see the cloud plume just tends to be narrower than the ordinary plume is if you put in the right kind of heat. And there's a protected core in the middle, right here, compared to the, what happens in the ordinary plume. Now, we did many of those with finite life plumes of flows. Uh, till then, people had been doing it with uh, um, steady flows, not just we, uh, when we did, made these experiments, but the very simple experiments made in uh, Cambridge, for example, in the 1950s and so on, also were continuous flows. Turner and um, many others made these experiments. But the fact of the matter is that uh, if you go to back to the Arizona movie and uh, draw the, the distribution of the cloud lifetime, um, a median value is about 10 minutes. So really, it is a transient flow. It's not a steady state flow. So the conclusion we came to in that paper we wrote was that if you ask me what kind of flow is it in a cumulus cloud, I would say it's a special example of a transient diabetic plume. Transient meaning it's not steady state. Diabetic meaning you're adding heat. And plume is, of course, the one that you make from the ground. We have made computations as well. I'll not go into these equations. These are really basically the Navier-Stokes equations. But in addition, you have the body force in the momentum equation due to gravity. Oh, sorry, not in there. Long one. G is uh, the acceleration due to gravity. T is the temperature difference, and that's the coefficient of expansion. And you have in the energy equation the amount of heat which you add. We made that in a temporal solution. At that time, we didn't have the computers to do more complicated things. I won't go into that in great detail. But there's one thing which we must remember. There's also a thing called vorticity. Well, all those who have done fluid dynamics know what vorticity is. But really, it has to do with vortices. And uh, the values of the vortex density locally is called the vorticity. It is a three-dimensional vector. It can have components in all three directions. And that's an equation governing the vorticity. But the most important thing, once again, here is to ask the vortices. The vortices can be created, can be created by the addition of heat. This temperature difference, which gradient, the temperature gradient, due to the action of gravity, actually creates vorticity. Uh, it's a force, it's a, it's a couple actually, which actually creates vorticity. And uh, you do that in this problem, and you can see this is the difference. On the left is an unheated jet, and you can see that uh, the flow is relatively ordered. In fact, there is a structure here, you know, this vortex is what we saw in that wavelet picture. At the bottom is this vortex ring, and here is a structure which is a bit like a cap or a turban, except that it is peaked here. That's a coherent structure. It's ordered structure. Uh, it's not that it's not turbulent, but turbulence actually does contain um, ordered structures sometimes. It's relatively ordered structures. You put in heat, well, those structures are no longer there. But what is more, there's an enormously more, a larger quantity of, uh, of vorticity. Uh, this is almost... 10 times what the other vorticity is. And you can see the remnants of that coherent structure. There's one here. You see, these were sort of the rings. And it's now pulled, extended there. And there's a lower co co coherent structure which is coming up, also extended that way. And that shows the vorticity squared, the interface vorticity squared. And you can see that. Uh, the one when it's heated, the unheated line is here, the heated line is here. So that's a factor of about 10. 10 times. The vorticity has gone up by about 10 times uh, 
due to the heat. And that is because of the torque in the vorticity equation. That torque is called the baroclinic torque, and I will introduce that in a moment. So, we have compared those shapes. Here is what, how the baroclinic torque works. See, the temperature gradient, the temperature difference is highest in the middle, so that's where the fluid is the lightest. So it has a velocity which is much higher, whereas on the sides, the velocities are also higher than they would be otherwise, but not as high as this. So the weight here has a certain direction, but it is such that uh, the torque is really acting this way, because this is heavier than this. And so there's a torque there, and a torque here, and that goes around if it's an axisymmetric thing, and therefore you have a torque around that circumference. And that torque is pushing the fluid up like this from the outside. That is uh, largely, but not entirely, responsible for the entrainment of the fluid. The fluid is not coming in like this. As you saw in, saw in that picture, it's being grabbed from the outside by these vortices. There is a, it doesn't uh, account for the whole distribution, but it's a major force acting there. And it is that uh, baroclinic torque which is really very important in the dynamics of that cloud. I just want to give you an example of vorticity. This is, of course, flow between a hot plate at the top and a cold plate at the bottom, so-called rayleigh benard flow. Uh, once again, we go through the transition here from lamina to turbulent. Lamina there, nice little vortex rings, transitional, the wobbling now, turbulent, and you can see that they're not all as nearly ordered and so on. So this is a transitional thing. Yeah. Okay, and here is a spiral on the other side. Well, so let me, um, well, that's a description of actually how that happens. Let me now go ahead and uh, show you some things that we are doing recently. Uh, I think that it's best that I do actually these computations that uh, we've been making. One is, one of these heated plumes, and we take an axial section at a Reynolds number of 2000. Uh, the history is here. This is the heating history, and uh, on the left is the legend. Blue is a, a G of only 0 0.04, but red is 0.35, and you can see how it changes. It changes rapidly from the low value to a relatively high value, and it's all over in something like uh, 20 flow units. And I want to show you a little movie about how it does that. That's it, that's at the beginning. And what is inside is the vorticity. The color code inside the thing is the vorticity. And if the, if the color is red, there's a lot of vorticity, and the color is pale blue, there's very little vorticity. Yeah. So that would be the kind of cloud that you get, actually, from that thing at a certain time, 90 flow units. You can see that um, it's like one of those pictures which we started with. The width doesn't vary very much here. This is a standard classical plume. This is where the heat is put in. And uh, you can see that uh, the vorticity is high here now because you stopped heating earlier. So it's the hot fluid going up there, and uh, that of course, mixes it, and there is the cauliflower type structure or dome or head of the cloud there. So, you can reproduce all of those um, probably. This is work which is just now being completed. What we've been doing now is actually computations. And um, we have the code working. We are, we are actually working with the fifth generation of these codes in our lab. Um, because we named them after Mega. Mega 1 is one of the very first codes, but uh, looking back on it, it was on a temporal flow. We've gone to 2 and 3 and 4, and a 5 is working. This is really 4. This is Mega 4, and the fifth one is also on the side. The fifth one now actually talks about a wet gas or a wet medium, so it has water vapor and liquid water, thermodynamics, and so on. 
So it's actually now much closer to actual reality than uh, you might think that these might be. But anyway, you can see what these flows are. Uh, there are three pairs of images here. Uh, in each pair, the heights are the same. The one on the left is a classical plume, and the one on the right is the diabetic plume. That should say the one which will become the cloud. And uh, this is actually the temperature. You can see that at time t equal to 66 flow units here, non-dimensional units. This is, this, is, this is the hottest part, just at the top of the heat injection zone, which is this. Here, of course, it's a classical plume, and there's no such thing. But it would actually have gone up, uh, let's see, the heights of match. This corresponds to what is happening at t equal to 90 units. You have to wait a great deal more to get this. Uh, whereas here, at 66, it's the same height. In other words, the velocity of this is very high, and the temperature is also very high. Same thing here at 120. Once again, this is the classical plume, no heating. This plume now goes all the way from the heat injection zone to this uh, dome at the top. It's now hot fluid. Now, the temperature here is lower because the heating is no longer there. I was at 81, but still, this is hot. This now isn't very hot. So you see the coherent structures begin to reappear here. If you see it here, there was a coherent structure here, or here there was one, you know, that's the vortex that I spoke about. But by the time you come here, you see, there is a structure here, and there's a structure here, and maybe another beginning to be here. So it's going back to a relatively cold state. Well, here are various values of the velocity and uh, uh, temperature. You can once again see what is happening. The red curve is uh, the diabetic plume. This is the, the velocity in the center. So you can see that once you add the heat, the usual plume, which is given by this blue curve, has now, because of the heat, the velocity has shot up, actually, well, by a factor of, uh, by quite a, quite a big factor, something like two and a half times, three times, and there are even more here, even more here at 72. But then the heat is distributing, and it's becoming cooler, and so it's lower here. So it goes through these three stages, high acceleration, and then beginning to slow down. So there are, these are all just pictures just from the computer now. This is the temperature, and you can see once again how the temperature varies. The red one is the hot fluids temperature. Large differences between that and the cold one. And um, vorticity. Well, I talked about vorticity. And you can see how much difference there is in the vorticity. It's, uh, it's enormous, actually. You see in the middle here, the vorticity here is around the well 0.2 here. And here it's around 10. <coughs> Huge. That heating, that latent heat release in the real cloud, and the heating that we put into the uh, um, equations here, they multiply the vorticity enormously. Some of that doesn't seem to have been noticed before. These, these things have not been noticed before. And so on. And now this is the flow width. Now in the flow width, you can see that the heated one is actually rather narrower than the normal one. The normal one would grow more or less linearly, as in the old experiment, you see, more or less linear. But here, it's not linear, more or less constant here and has a dome. So you can see once again that heat plays a big role in making that cloud special. And now come to my final slides. Um, here, is a, here is the result of an atmospheric measurement, uh, quite an old one, 1961. Those are the cloud edges as you see here, as you go up. And uh, what what Saunders does is to, uh, you know, 
at intervals of 37 seconds, he has uh, got these um, measurements. And the velocity of the protuberances and the modules, as he calls them, at different parts here, are shown. Now, here is the time in seconds. Early, it's about 3 meters per second. It's not grown very much. It's here. Then in the middle, it increases. And then here it increases even more. So it, it has three various regions in terms of the velocity of the weather that cloud is growing. And here is what we have computed. Once again, uh, this is the blue, and this is the heat release zone. You can see how much it, it really accelerates as you put in the blue, and then it settles down to a slightly higher value. So here we have this is, uh, well, both, both of these are actually velocities. Here they're actually given the absolute velocities. Here they're given in terms of the central line velocity. So you can see that there is a resemblance. We are, in fact, therefore, producing many features of a real cloud. Here's another one of the azimuthal vorticity. And I think maybe it shows you how it's growing. The vorticity is, also, is, is uh, concentrating at the top. And it looks like this, actually. Once again, comparing um, comparing two different uh, flow fields here. Um, both are 72, actually. And you can see the vorticity. The vorticity is now all here. And you can see the arrows outside now, outside this boundary. Fluid is being expelled. It's pushing out, as you might ask. It keeps rising, so it keeps pushing it out. Down here, we are back to coherent structures here. Interest events, fluid being entrained here. So, I think we can think of it as what we have basically done. What I would like to do is. Um, come to the conclusions. So our conclusions over all these years of work is, first of all, that the cumulus cloud is a special kind of transient diabatic blue. The major difference between the cumulus cloud and a classical plume is the addition of heat as water vapor condenses into liquid water. And that may in turn freeze into ice. The simulations we have made in the lab reproduce familiar cloud forms of the cumulus family just with the addition of heat. And the baroclinic talk created by this kind of off-source heating explains several dynamical characteristics of the features of the cumulus cloud. And as the computing power increases, there is reason to believe that, before long, a low-renounceable low cumulus flow, uh, I mentioned the mixing transition. There's the mixing transition at a Reynolds number around 10,000. Beyond that, the Reynolds number really doesn't matter can be simulated on the computer. Right now what we are doing is in actual fact um, something which is water vapor, liquid water, thermodynamics, and quite a bit more. So this is going to be more realistic. It's on the computer right now, and maybe in, um, maybe in another six months, we will have results from that, and we should be even closer to what happens. These have been published over the years, and uh, at various journals, American Meteorological Society, Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, and so on. So, uh, those are all, and these are the people who have worked with me, and you can see there are quite a few of them over the years. And uh, they received support from uh, Intel at Bangalore, and from uh, people at NAL, and the computer, at uh, the Indian Institute of Science and at CDAC, and financial grants at various times from DST, ISRO, um, INSA Gordon Jubilee Professorship, and so on. Thank you very much for listening.
as well, as far as I'm concerned, my experience was uh, very interesting and very enjoyable too. Because after a while, they started asking me all kinds of questions. And I, I liked it. I liked it. That meant that uh, the thing had begun to make them think about uh, how so many different things that happen in clouds can be understood with a few certain relatively simple principles. I think it's a great thing to do that and uh, I enjoyed it very much incidentally.